Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be introducing the method of sections, a method used to determine uh, shear and bending moment diagrams and shear and moment relationships in beams. Uh, we'll also be uh, describing the three, uh, we'll be introducing the three main uh, methods of determining shear and moment diagrams, although this mo video will focus on the method of sections. We will be introducing it, and then in a follow-up video, we'll, we'll be performing some long-form examples with the method of sections. So let's look at, so the topic de jour, the topic for today, is shear and bending moment diagrams, or more specifically, uh, just shear and bending moment investigations, etc. So, again, the topic for today is shear and bending moment diagrams. So shear and bending moment diagrams. Now there are going to, so uh, first of all, let's discuss what the purpose of these are and what they are. So first I want to look at what they are. Uh, so really we need to look at the what, the why, the how, all the classic uh, journalism tropes, etc. So what are they? Well, they are uh, diagrams or functions. Sometimes you only compute them as diagrams, sometimes you compute them as functions, depending on what method you're using to obtain them, uh, that show internal forces on a beam. So in other words, let's say, uh, let's look at a very simple example. Let's say you had a simple distributed load, a uniform distributed load on a simply supported beam. Something like this here, where you have a uniform load W applied over a beam length L. I would refer to this as a load diagram. In this load diagram, we can see all of the func all of the loads, the external loads that are applied to this beam. And in particular, this would just be the, uh, in this case, just the only uh, exterior load would be this uh, uniform load, although we also would have reactions, of course. So if I were then to draw a free body diagram of this, if I were to draw a free body diagram, I would have something like this. I would have my same uniform load across the top, but then I would also have some reactions. And assuming this is, and because this is symmetric, I can easily determine that the reactions would just be WL over T here. Now I'm going to illustrate what the shear and bending moment diagrams uh, for this would look like, although uh, just uh, this is just to illustrate uh, what they are before we get into actually how to calculate them so, and determine them. So here do not worry too much about how I'm getting this. We will look at that. We will be looking at this in a bit, although this may be a review from statics, mechanics, etc. So a shear diagram might look something like this. So let's see, you'd have a downward shear arrow here, yep. And so a, a shear diagram would look something like this. From WL over 2 to WL over 2 here. And this would be my shear diagram. Again, simply a plot showing the uh, shear as a function of length along the beam or as a function of position along the beam, I should probably say. And then you can also have a moment diagram. And in this case, this would be parabolic. And this would have a peak of uh, WL squared over 8. WL squared over 8. And this would be your moment diagram. And so what's the purpose of these? Well, 
we saw previously that, uh, as we discussed in our some of our previous lectures, introduction to shear and introduction to moment, uh, the design of sections, the design of steel, concrete, wood, doesn't matter what it is, the design of sections is intimately tied to the uh, to the nature of shear and moment. Remember how we looked at with a, for example, a I section or a W section, how the, the web primarily carries shear and the flanges primarily carry moment. Well, if you're going to design or select a section to carry a certain uh, load, you need, because the, uh, sec the nature of the section is so intimately tied to shear and moment, if you're going to design a beam, you need to know the shear and moment that are applied to that beam. Now, often in design, we'll be, often in design we're going to be based, we're going to be looking at the maximum, but that's not always the case. Um, but if I just, let's, but, but in terms of, um, but looking at the simplest case, if you're looking at it just in general, um, if you have a, if you have a beam like this, and I want to know what uh, shear I should design this beam for, if I'm, say, uh, sizing a wood or a steel section, well, if I'm designing this beam, I know I need to design it for this to, to carry this amount of shear, WL over 2, and I know that it must be able to carry WL squared over 8 uh, units of uh, moment. And I would then use those to size my beam in terms of, uh, in terms of its web thickness, its, uh, in terms of its flange width and thickness, its depth, all of the characteristics of a beam that you need that you will actually uh, learn how to do in, um, say, steel design or concrete design, etc. Okay, and fundamentally, this really is the purpose of shear and bending moment diagrams. We want to know, um, we want to basically completely map out. Uh, everything there is to know about shear and moment along the beam. We want to know the maximum. We want to know the back maximum values, as where as well uh, as well as where they occur. So if we know the maximum values and where they occur, then we can use that information to then go and uh, size a given beam. Okay, comments in the chat here. Just a second. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, any questions about this? Okay, so with that out of the way, now that we've introduced what they're for, let's begin looking at uh, how we actually determine them. And there are three methods we're going to learn in this class, and we'll just uh, break them down. So let's erase this, and then we'll start looking at what the methods of determining shear and bending moment diagrams are. Also, the, thing, the things we learn here about shear and bending moment diagrams will then feed directly into our later discussions of calculating um, deflections on beams and rotations and other things as well. So this is kind of a, um, you learn about shear and bending moment diagrams in statics, but you don't usually learn about deflections and things. So essentially we'll be carrying the, uh, what you learned in statics. Um, although that may need a bit of review, uh, essentially we'll be carrying on what you learned in statics, but looking at the next levels uh, of these uh, relationships, and uh, we'll be working through those. Okay. So I want to introduce the three methods, and then we'll start looking at the first one. Okay, so let's discuss methods of determining shear and bending moment diagrams or uh, functions. So methods. There are three primary methods. Uh, one, the method of sections. This is where we simply cut a beam, imagine, you know, using an imaginary line, we cut a beam and, in, and investigate what kind of forces occur within it. So the method of sections. Uh, second, we have integration. 
solving for shear and moment by integration, just basically direct integration, or essentially directly applying the shear, the relationships between um, uh, distributed load, shear, and moment. And finally, we have inspection, which is more of a geometric uh, interpretation. And we'll be looking at each of these in their turn. So um, each of these have their own benefits and drawbacks. Um, method of sections is uh, useful if you, is especially useful if you just want the shear and moment at a point. Uh, inspection is very uh, useful if you just want the uh, if you're primarily concerned with the maximum value. I would say, and integration is the uh, gives you the most information, but it is uh, the most time consuming mathematically to work through. Okay, so methods. Uh, so for, let's first consider the method of sections. Let us first consider the method of sections. So here we will cut a beam at X So first, we'll cut the beam at location x, and then second, we will uh, assume positive shear and moment at that location, and positive moment at that location. And then three, uh, apply equilibrium. And we'll see what this means. Now, as a review, our sign convention for shear and moment will be as follows. A, uh, if we have positive shear, we will have a downward shear arrow on the right hand side and an upward shear arrow on the left hand side. And then positive moment is something that produces positive curvature or positive bending, like this here. And as a reminder on the shear, it's not the fact that it is a, a upward arrow or a downward arrow that makes it positive. It is that you have an upward arrow on the left hand side and a downward arrow on the right hand side. And also, as a review, remember, these are just sign conventions. These are, uh, these are, you know, simply human decisions. These are completely arbitrary as what is positive, what's negative. Um, but in terms of uh, calculating these things, we do, need, we do need to consider something as positive, something as negative. And this is what we'll be using in this course. Okay. So let's look at, uh, I think the best way to illustrate the method of sections is to simply look at a, start by looking at a very simple example. And in fact, maybe we can actually look at the, uh, let's look first at that simply supported uniform beam. Because I told you what the shear and moment are, but it'd be better if I could actually prove that. Engineering is, of course, supposed to be based on analysis, and mathematics, and science, and physics, and we don't design buildings saying, well, why, how, how do you know that it uh, uh, can carry the loads and carry the forces that it needs to? We don't just say, well, because Professor Laird said so. No, it uh, matters what kind of uh, math and demonstration I can do. Okay. So let's look at this example. And again, we have a uniform load of W. Applied across the top of the beam. And this has length of L. And then let's say I want to find, uh, I'm going to again use the method of sections here. And so I'm going to cut this at some location X. I'm going to cut this at X. With X, I'm going to measure from the left-hand side of the beam. So I'm going to cut this at X. 
And now I'm going to consider the free body diagram of this thing in isolation. So also as a reminder, I would have some reactions on here. I would have WL over two and WL over two, like so. WL over two and WL over two. So then uh, let's go and look at a free body diagram of this beam. And let's look at the forces on this. Well, we have our uniform distributed load. And again, we're not considering the entire beam. We are only considering the portion of the beam that we cut um, via our section here. And this thing is going to have a length, not of L now, but of X as shown. And forces, we still have this WL over two. The reaction remains. And then um, let's say we have, now, let now let's assume some forces on here. I'm going to assume a downward shear arrow because that would be positive in this case. Again, um, in terms of directions on this, I am looking, when I cut this and I isolate this piece here, I am looking at the right hand side of an element. So I'm going, to, if I'm going to assume positive shear, I'll have a downward shear arrow. If I was looking at the other piece, in other words, if I had cut out and isolated this section here, I would get something, I would have my element here, and then I would have an upward shear arrow like this. Because on the left-hand side of an element, an upward arrow represents positive shear. And then we also want to have a moment here. And I'm going to designate these M, uh, Mx and Vx. So the uh, moment at X and the shear at X. And so what we have done is we have, again, stepping back a bit, what we have done is we've uh, cut the beam at a certain location X and we have gone and uh, assumed positive shear and positive moment at that cut. So how do I know that there were shear and moment here? How did I know that these were the uh, forces I needed to assume? Well, um, this is by default, if you have a rigid connection and this beam is rigidly joined all the way through, um, there's no pins, there's no, uh, you know, uh, roller joints or anything like that. Unless you have some sort of release, like a moment release or a force release interior to this, whenever you cut a beam or a column, you're going to have axial force, shear, and moment. Now, I could also draw an axial force on here, um, but I, uh, since we don't have any, ver since we only have vertical forces on here, I'm not going to have any tension or compression in this beam. Okay, so we have our elements, and now we just need to apply equilibrium. Now, um, I am going to need, in order to apply equilibrium, I am going to need to find the equivalent point force of this distributed load, and that's not going to be too bad. Let's see. So the equivalent point load of this, and again, this is not a, uh, a, as a reminder, I'm not applying a new load to the structure. I'm just finding what equivalent point load I have, would have to apply to this to equal the same, to produce the same uh, effects as this distributed load. And let's see, this would be equal to um, not W times L, but W times X. And this would be applied at a distance of X over two or one half X. So X over two or one half X. And now we can apply some equilibrium or some equations of equilibrium, I should say. So again, we have our reaction on the left here. We have our shear and moment here. And we have our, uh, we have our downward force uh, here. We have our equivalent downward point, uh, we have our equivalent point load here. So WX, W over two, et cetera. Okay, so now um, let's go ahead and apply uh, the equations of equilibrium. And uh, actually, I think I'm going to do that on this board over here, just so I have plenty of space. So when I say equations of equilibrium, what I mean is, again, just applying summation of forces in the vertical direction and summation of moments. And using these, I will then solve for uh, 
basically I'm, what I'm looking for is my Vx and my Mx. If I know, because Vx and Mx are just taking at some arbitrary point x, if I can solve for those, then I can directly determine that I will have a uh, function of shear, then I will have shear as a function of x. So let's consider this. So I want to first do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, and that will enable me to get Vx. So summation of forces in the y direction, and I will have, let's see, in the upward direction, I will have Wl over 2, the reaction on the left side, then minus Wx. Oh, not over anything, just Wx, minus Wx, and then minus Vx. Minus Vx, and the, we will assume this is in static equilibrium, so we'll set this equal to zero, because this is, we're assuming that our beam is not accelerating and therefore flying through the air, because that would be uh, bad for most buildings. That's the, that's the technical term, bad. Um, anyway, so if I then solve for Vx, I get that Vx, just moving this over here, I get that Vx is equal to Wl over 2 uh, minus Wx, or I could just call this V as a function of x, is equal to Wl over 2 minus Wx. Now, if I wanted to see what this looked like, if I wanted to investigate a few points, um, let's see what V of 0 looks like. When x is 0, and we're right over here on the left-hand side of the beam, well, in that case, this term will drop out, and so we would just have Wl over 2. In other words, the simply the reaction on the left-hand side of the beam. And then if I was looking at L over 2, V of L over 2, actually, uh, yeah, V of L over 2, I'll use a capital L here to be consistent with what I have here, V of L over 2, uh, if I plug that into here, I would have um, WL over 2, the original reaction, minus W times L over 2, or that would simply be 0. In other words, the shear, or if I were to plot this out, just like we did previously, on the left-hand side, I would have WL over 2, and it would, uh, and if you plugged in uh, L, but also if you plugged in L, you can check this if you're curious, or not W, uh, let's say V as a, at point L. V at point L would equal negative uh, W L over two. Feel free to check that. But if you then have these critical, if you then have these points and you plot them on a diagram, you would get a shear diagram like this, where we go from uh, WL over 2 on the left to negative WL over 2 on the right. Next, I want to look at the moment or the moment equation, the moment function. And to do that, I'm going to try to squeeze this in here, so pardon my lovely writing. So let's do a summation of moments and uh, for convenience, I'm going to do the summation of moments about point x. Now, I could do any point, but uh, the nice thing about taking the mo summation of moments about point x is that then I don't need to consider the moment generated by a shear here, by the internal shear force, because that's it's that force's line of action passes directly through point x. And in terms of calculation um, checking and calculation uh, QAQC, whatever you want to call it, um, the nice thing about doing that is that my result here will not affect my result here. So they're kind of independent in that way. So if I take a summation of moments about x counterclockwise positive, let's see. So I'm going to have, uh, first I'll have WL over 2, and that will generate a negative or clockwise moment about point x. 
So I'm going to have negative WL over 2 times its moment arm length of x here. And then uh, our WX force will be generating a positive or clockwise or counterclockwise moment about point x. So plus uh, WX times a moment arm of x over 2. And then I have the moment at point x. I cannot forget that. And that's just going to be plus mx. So we have this lovely equation written on several lines. But anyway, it's just, it's just, it's just basic statics applying balance of moments at a point. And then, therefore, if we solve for mx, I will get that mx is equal to, well, let's see. I'll have, if I solve for uh, mx, I will get that I have, uh, let's see, that would, go, that would be wlx over 2 minus wx squared over 2. If I manage to do that math correctly. So that would be m as a function of x as well. Now, let's investigate this function at a few critical points and see if we can get the shear uh, or the moment diagram from that. And to do this, we will first need to erase this board. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So we have our moment function, and I just want to investigate a few points. I want to look at the, um, the value of this function at the left-hand side, at the center, and the right-hand side. So let's find the moment at 0, moment at x equals 0. Well, any term with an x in it is going to go to 0, so that just has to equal 0. All right, simple enough. Now, what if we looked at the moment at x equals L over 2. So halfway across the beam. Well, let's see. We would have uh, here WL times L over 2 divided by 2 minus W times L over 2 squared over 2. And that would then be WL squared over 4 minus WL squared over 8. And if you subtract these, you'll get uh, this will reduce to WL squared over 8. So that's our center moment, and that would be our maximum moment. And then M at X equals L at the far uh, right-hand side of the beam here. Uh, that would just be, let's see, so we would have... Just plugging this in, substituting in uh, L for X, you would have W L times L divided by 2 minus W times L squared over 2. And we have W L squared over 2, W L squared over 2. That indeed comes to 0. So we end up having a plot that looks like this. Now, from these three points, you can't determine that it's parabolic. But if you did, if you went and uh, actually got a whole series of points, you know, looked at if you, if you wanted to and uh, actually determined a whole series of points, you could get that parabolic shape, or you could just simply recognize this is clearly a quadratic function. This is clearly uh, if you think about like, think back to your basic mathematics, algebra one, algebra two, what have you, and a little calculus. Um, this is a uh, this is clearly a concave down function, so we should expect a concave down function like this, and it is quadratic, so we should expect a quadratic behavior like this. Okay, and that is uh, one example of the method of sections. 
but there are some uh, some uh, not caveats, but there are some subtleties to the method of sections that we should discuss. Questions on this so far? Okay, so I'm going to uh, erase this then, and we can look then at uh, some of the peculiarities or the uh, tripping points in the method of sections. We'll look at some of the most common, uh, most common mistakes that are made. Well, aside from assuming the wrong uh, direction for shear. Which I would totally never do. Okay, now the trickiest thing about the method of sections is knowing how many sections to take. So, so let's think about the method of sections and we're gonna particularly look at how many sections to take. See, that, for that beam we looked at previously, the, the uniform load simply supported beam, that was nice in particular. Okay, let's, let me actually just draw this out. And I'll help illustrate this, I hope. So if we have our uniform load on our simply supported beam, I want to think about uh, mathematics. In particular, I want to think a little bit about calculus. Now, um, one topic you learn a lot in calculus, and you spend a lot of time discussing, um, in terms of definitions of functions and things, you may recall in calculus working with continuity. Where a, whether a function is continuous or not. And uh, with something like this, with a, uh, with a uniform shear, or with a uniform force across the top, both the shear and the moment end up being nice and continuous. So we have a, a shear that looks like this and a moment that looks like this. Simple enough, but consider this from the point, again, consider this mathematically. Um, from this point to this point, along the entire length of the beam, this is a uniform function. I have a uniform linear function for the shear and a uniform parabolic function for the moment. Um, now you could consider, now we could say that there are discontinuities on the ends of the beam, where, uh, and, and how do I tell if there's a discontinuity just by looking at this chart, or just looking at this uh, diagram? Well, I can tell there's discontinuity because at one point, the, uh, the shear just jumps. At right at, zero, right at x equals zero, it jumps up to a positive shear and uh, to a positive shear value, and that would be WL over two again. And so this represents a discontinuity, but because the discontinuities and the, the only discontinuities in this are at the end, the very ends of the beam, it doesn't really affect our uh, method of sections because we can take a section anywhere along this and the same relationship will apply. In other words, um, this is because this is a continuous function, 
I can cut this here, I can cut this here, I can cut this here, and the same relationships will apply all the way across. It is a continuous function. And again, because it can, it's a continuous function, I can cut this anywhere from uh, one discontinuity to the other discontinuity, and I will have, and it, and it won't matter, uh, I, can do, I can determine this as a function of x, I can determine these relationships as a function of x, and that function will be valid because there are no discontinuities. However, imagine I had a moment function something like this. Let's say I had a moment function like this, except somehow the moment abruptly changed at some location. This represents a discontinuous or a discontinuity in our moment function. So what I would need, if I wanted to describe the full, if I think about this, okay, think back to uh, piecewise functions in mathematics. And a piecewise function, again, is where you have something like f of x equals something for when x is greater than something, something for when x is less than something. That's what I mean by a piecewise function. So if I want to fully describe this moment function, I'm going to need, uh, you would ha need a, a piecewise moment function. You would need a piecewise moment function to describe this. So I would have something like m as a function of x is equal to some function from, if, let's say this was point, let's say this was at point a here. I would have maybe x is less than a, and then some other function when x is greater than a. And so if you have any kind of discontinuities in your beam, um, any discontinuities in particular uh, in the middle of your beam, then you'll have to use, then we'll need to develop multiple functions in order to compute the moment, uh, the full shear and moment relationships across the entire beam. So what do these discontinuities actually look like? Let's investigate what these discontinuities actually look like. Or let's see what kind of examples we can find of them. And these, uh, it's, it, it is interesting that these discontinuities are actually um, a consequence of our mathematical assumptions, as, as we'll see. I just found this kind of interesting, but maybe I'm just weird. Okay. Interesting for a certain definition of interesting. So let's think about types of discontinuities. Now I'm going to ignore, I'm not going to talk right now about discontinuities in geometry, like if the cross section of the beam suddenly changes, because that, that would change the deflection and the rotation, but that wouldn't actually change the shear and moment functions. Okay, but think about something like this. Uh, so types of discontinuities. Your types of discontinuities, and there's going to be a few of them. So the first thing I want to consider is point loads. This is probably your most common discontinuity. So if you have a point load like this, well, what that's going to do is that's going to create a sudden break in your shear diagram. So something like this. So you might have something like this. Where that, where that point load occurs, you're going to have a drop in your uh, moment diagram, or your shear diagram. Uh, well, actually, that should probably be more like, I guess I could just label that uh, from here to here it would be equal to P. You're going to, whenever there's a point load on a uh, beam, the shear diagram at that location, if it's a downward point load, drops a magnitude equal to P. So if it was up here, it will drop down P to a new value of whatever that may be. So what this means is that if I wanted to use the method of sections, I would have to take one section here and another section here. And using those two sections, I would be able to then get my 
uh, piecewise functions that would enable me to uh, solve for shear and moment. Second, so we have point loads. Um, we also have discontinuities in, uh, or I sh since I'm already using the word discontinuities, I should maybe use that again. But maybe I could say uh, changes in distributed load functions. So what do I mean by this? Well, uh, again, last time uh, we looked at previously, we had that nice uniform constant value, uniform load, and there are other, there are many other types of distributed load. For example, you could have a linear load, a linearly decreasing uh, distributed load, but this still would not have any discontinuities in it. Notice the same linear function, same y equals mx plus b function, would describe this load all the way from the left-hand side of the beam to the right. So there's no discontinuities there. However, what if I had something like this? What if I had a beam? And let's say there was only a distributed load applied over part of it. Here the function of the load di of, of the uh, here the load function of W wouldn't be terribly comp uh, terribly complicated. In fact, I would still call it W. However, it would only go up to a certain point, and this point represents a discontinuity. And so I would need one uh, cut function. I would need one to take one section here, uh, somewhere on that side of this continuity, another one here, somewhere on this side of this continuity. Again my load, if I have any change in my load function, that will represent, or the location of that change represents a discontinuity uh, in my load function, which will represent a discon ultimately represent a discontinuity in my shear and moment functions. And finally, and we could probably think of some others as well, but uh, these are the big ones you need to look out for. So three, the last one I want to talk about is uh, point moments. So we looked at point loads, but you can also have point moments or couples. In other words, if you have a beam, simply support a beam, for example, and uh, you have something like this, a, point, a couple at a location, uh, that couple will not represent a discontinuity in the shear diagram, but it will produce a, let's say there is just an M applied here, your M diagram then uh, might have something like this. If that was the only force on the beam, there would be a jump upward or downward in my moment diagram. And then I suppose I should also list one final um, example of discontinuity. And that comes from reactions. Now, I haven't included reactions prior because we've talked, we've, been, we've mainly been looking at simply supported beams, but you absolutely can have beams with, re, with uh, support points, reactions somewhere interior to the beam, somewhere inside the beam, or somewhere in the beam's interior, I should say. And if you have that, that will represent a discontinuity. So let's say you have a beam, and let's say you had a, I don't know, something like this. This would be statically indeterminate most likely, but uh, uh, let's say you had a uh, some sort of load function on this, and it wouldn't have to be uniform. It could be any number of things, some w as a function of x. But there are going to be reactions, like an AY, a BY, and a CY on this, for example. Now, your shear diagram uh, might look something like this. Now, you actually have to look at the numbers to get it exactly, but if I can manage to draw a straight line, it might look something like this.
So you would have one function from A to B, and you could, you, if you wanted to find that function by the method of sections, you could just cut it at x. And, uh, but then that function would uh, end, that particular point of the, that particular piece of that piecewise function would end when you reached point B here. And so then you would need to take another cut somewhere between B and C in order to get uh, the moment function between those two points. So again, uh, you would have a discontinuity here at B. And you would need one function. So you'd have like an F, like a V1 of X, and then maybe a V2 of X, something like this. So the basic idea is that uh, the process uh, for method of sections, and this will uh, have some similar um, uh, reflections, will have some similar applications when we look at the other methods this year in moment diagrams. Uh, process for method of sections, Assuming you want the sheared moment across the entire beam, one, locate your discontinuities. So you first have to locate your discontinuities. And then second, um, you need to cut a number of times Uh, to bridge all discontinuities. I'll just say discontinuities. Okay. And the number generally is going to be if you have, um, actually, let me just illustrate this here. If you want to figure out the number of sections you're going to need to make, you can determine that just from the number of uh, internal discontinuities. I will mention internal discontinuities um, rather than external, though supports, external supports, for example. So generally, uh, let's look at this in more general terms. So we could perhaps say if n is the number of locations on a beam's interior, Uh, where discontinuities apply, if that is the case, then the, then uh, the number of sections necessary is simply n plus one. The number of sections needed to fully describe the beam's shear and moment is n plus one. So I want to illustrate this with a couple examples, a couple simple and quick examples. All right, so let's say we had a beam, 
like this. And let's say we had a couple point loads on this. Well, let's think about this. How many discontinuities do I have in the beam's interior? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking here only at the interior discontinuity, so I can ignore the edge reactions, which, again, we're only taking method of sections along the beam's length, so we don't need to worry about those. Um, but I would have two here, so I would need three sections. If I want to fully describe this beam's behavior, or its shear and moment behavior, I would need to cut it somewhere in here, somewhere between the two point loads, and somewhere here. What if I had something like this, where you had a, a uniform load, not a uniform load, a distributed load that is kind of triangular like this? Well, here, think about where my discontinuities are. I have just one discontinuity right at this location at the, at the center of the beam here. And that's a discontinuity, and this is interesting because this is a discontinuity, uh, even though if I look at the actual values of the shear of the load, of the distributed load function, it would be constant across the entire, well, it would be uh, smooth across the, smooth is the wrong word. Um, uh, if I looked at the, uh, if I looked at the values, there would be no jumps in the, sh in the uh, load function. In other words, I don't, uh, I don't have any point loads or anything, but the shear or the, but the load function itself will change. Remember, a discontinuity can be represented, uh, a change in the load function is a discontinuity. So therefore, I would need two sections here. And I would need to cut, uh, so this is my dividing point, I would need to cut somewhere in here and somewhere between here and here. Now, what if I had something like this? What if I had a beam, oh, something like this, and I'll have a really fun one here. This would be just, oh, so much fun to actually calculate, but that's okay. And let's put a distributed load on over here to make it fun. And heck, I'll put a couple on that location there. And let's call these points, uh, I'll call this point A, B, C, D, and E. Well, now, um, I do actually have quite a few discontinuities, but what really matters, again, is the uh, l number of locations of discontinuities, because this point, this point load and the end of this distributed load are at the same point, point B, so that's one location. Our uh, point load and our couple, or our point moment here, at point C represent another location. And point D, where this new uh, distributed load starts up, that is another point. So in this case, N would be equal to three, so I would need four sections. I would need, um, I would need one section here from A to B, I would need another one here between B and C, another one here between C and D, and then another here between D and E. So, um, and that is the basic idea of the method of sections. All right, so the key things to keep in mind are, uh, again, you're going to be cutting at a certain point. You need to then assume a positive shear and a positive moment at the location, being uh, very careful to consider what the directions are uh, for the element that you're isolating. Also, uh, one other thing, make sure you use a constant x value across uh, your um, across your functions. You, you use, uh, typically I just define x as zero at the left-hand side of the beam. You do not, uh, you do not, if you're cutting and if you're doing like, for example, from B to C here, you don't restart x at zero at B. So anyway, that is my brief introduction to the method of sections. Uh, in a bit, we will also be looking at, I, I, I will also post a video where we'll be looking at some examples, uh, some long form examples of the method of sections. All right, any questions? All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions uh, in the comments below. Uh, now, uh, in terms of what we looked at today, we saw, we introduced the method of sections. We saw uh, the basic idea of cutting a uh, beam at a certain location to reveal the interior shear and bending moment uh, forces therein. 
And we also discussed some um, limitations or at least some uh, difficulties with the method of sections, in particular considering, or in particular considering um, the number and location of where to make a section in order to uh, make sure that you capture the full behavior of a beam's shear and bending moment relationships. Again, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, let, leave any comments below if you have them. Uh, upvotes and comments and subscribe to make the robots happy, as I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Regardless, that'll do it for now. Uh, thank you all for uh, watching. Hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.